multiplier up. This is Matterfall, developed by Housemark, pub uh, published by Sony. In Matterfall, you play Avalon Darrow, whose job is to clean up this kind of weapons testing mess that's happened uh, on Earth while Earth is being evacuated from said mess. So you've got lots of things to shoot and lots of humans to rescue, which is kind of standard practice for Housemark at this point. This is a twin stick arcade shooter uh, in 2D this time. so. Super Stardust, you were locked to a planet, and in Resogun, you were locked to a cylinder on a planet, and in Next Machina, you were kind of jumped around various smaller arenas. Uh, Matterfall, you're in a, a level. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a big open 2D level, like Metroid or like Strider, like Bionic Commando, uh, and you just move through that level, doing twin stick things. You've got a couple of different abilities. You've got You've got your shoot on your twin sticks, you've got your jump, you've got your dash, you've got your stun, you've got your matter gun thing. You've got various augmentations that you can pick up throughout the level as well. There's a lot you can do with Avalon Darrow, and because the game is a twin stick shooter, a lot of the abilities have to be mapped to the shoulder buttons, which isn't normally a problem until you add jump to the, to the mix, because, at least for me, jump is X on PlayStation. Uh, and it is not X in Matterfall, it's a shoulder button, I don't remember which one. And not remembering which one is a kind of common thing that happens to me while playing this game. I feel like I don't have enough fingers to play it, I just feel clumsy. The game is so fast and you need to react so quickly, the amount of times I've pressed the wrong button is just ridiculous. Anyway, you have your jump, double jump, you've got your dash, your dash stuns enemies. Which is a bit like uh, Mighty Number no. Nine's kind of dash, and they do extra damage. You don't have to dash into enemies like you do in Mighty Number no. Nine, but it's kind of a similar idea. You've got your matter gun, which um, builds platforms, and you can use that to either move through the area, or you can use it to block off enemies so they can't shoot at you while you deal with this group on the left side of the platform. You can block off enemies on the right side of the platform. There's a lot in it. It's a lot of fun. I just don't feel accomplished when I get to a level, I suppose. It, it kind of feels like luck, unlike Max Machina or Resogun, Super Stardust, whatever. You kind of feel like, you know, you're doing a good job, whereas for me anyway in Matterfall, it, I don't. I kind of feel like I'm just tripping over people and just clumsily killing enemies, I don't know. Music-wise, it's, it's Ari Bukinen again. Uh, it's really good, it's really strong music. Um, I do like the next Machina soundtrack a lot more, but this is still very good. I mean, if you like Housemark games, this is another Housemark game. It's an arcade twin stick shooter. It's very well done, it's very well polished. I feel like I need to be an octopus to play it, but maybe you won't. That's me, Avalon Darrow, at your service. Today. We begin to make our dream reality. This is Mass Effect Andromeda, developed by BioWare Montreal, which is no longer in business, and published by EA. So, we'll get it out of the way. The reason I haven't played this yet is because of the state that the game was launched in. It was very buggy when it was launched, and EA have recently come out and said, we're done patching it, this is the last single player content you're going to get. So this is patch uh, 1.10, that's what I'm playing at. So this is as good as Mass Effect Andromeda is going to get, and it's still very buggy. Uh, there's nothing game breaking in it. You're still able to progress fine. Most of it is just polish, and most of it is around the animation system. It's just wrong animations playing, or just the animations in general just not looking right. Your main character also has this weird mocap hunch thing, is what I'm going to call it, because I've seen it in other games. So this is not unique to Andromeda, but it's just super annoying. The character is just always hunched over, they never stand up straight. Anyway, moving on. There's a lot I don't like about the game, I'm overall very disappointed with it, so I will say the couple of things that I did like. Uh, the environments, so the various planets you go on are varied, they're nice to look at, they're nice to drive around in, they're nice to just play the game within that environment, they did a good job there. Particularly the one that has low gravity, I really like that one. 
Um, the combat is a lot more mobile, so it's not really a cover shooter, even though I did play most of the game as a cover shooter, you don't have to. Uh, so you have jump jets that you can move you around the environment a lot easier. You can get up on top of buildings, you can move out of cover very quickly, you can move towards enemies, away from enemies very fast with dashing. That's all good. Now I will get into the parts that I did not like. Uh, we'll stick with the combat for a minute. So you have access to all of the powers and all of the classes using this profile switching system that the game has added. This wasn't in the original Mass Effect, this is only for this one. And that essentially allows you to pick any power you want from across the classes that Mass Effect has. So you're not locked down to any one particular class, which sounds good until you realize how it's implemented. They don't tell you that you can swap profiles in combat. So that's, that's problem number one. The only way you can do it is you have to set up favorites, so favorites loadouts that you can swap between. So fine, you set them up, grand. Um, and the way I had them set up was, normally I play an adept, which is a biotic guy. Um, so I use a lot of biotic powers, which take care of the grunts fairly easily, but if you encounter something that has armor or something that has shields, you need to swap to something that can deal with them, because biotics don't deal with them, and that's a weird rule the game has, I don't know why. You hear plenty of stories of biotics ripping tanks apart. I'm fairly certain they have armor on them. Anyway, you'd swap to a power that can use, that deals with armor, that deals with shields. The problem is, when you swap, the cooldowns reset. Which means you don't have immediate access to that power. By the time the cooldowns have finished, that enemy is dead. Or you are dead. Okay, I guess I'll swap back to my old powers, the ones I normally use. Guess what? The cooldowns have reset on them too. Oh, okay, so now I'm just swapping between them, not actually getting to use any of my powers. Meanwhile, I'm probably dead at this point, or the fight is over. Great. What was the point of Profile Switch? It's done. Could have had a really, could have been really good, and just the way they implemented it. Very simple way to implement it was just not reset the cooldown. Or just have them ready to go the first time, and then when you swap, they reset. That's fine. That would have worked grand. Nope. Anyway. That's the big, that was my big turn off. The rest of it is, Mass Effect is a very heavy story game. Bioware makes story games. This story is crap. <laughs> I'm just gonna say it outright, it's crap. Uh, the characters are uninteresting, particularly your main character has no personality. Uh, at least with Shepard, you could have gone the Paragade, Paragon or Renegade route. You know, good guy, bad guy route. That has a bit of personality to it. This character, they split your responses through a uh, logical or a hard ass or uh, emotional or sarcastic responses. And you think, I pick enough of those choices, that's what my character will become. But no, your character's just whatever. Your choices are more or less meaningless. They all have the same response anyway. It's just what flavor of response do you want? So that's not great. Um, secondary quests, too much busy work. You're just bounced around planets. I'm going to this planet. Oh no, they're on this planet now. Okay, I guess I'll go there. Oh no, no, they're over here. Oh, okay, great. Could we not have just localized it to one planet, please? There's too many loading times. The villain is just whatever. He's so uninteresting. He's no Saren. He's no Sovereign. He's no Harbinger. He's no elusive man. It's just bleh, whatever. The villains in general are some weird mix of the Borg and the Kunari from Dragon Age, and they're not as interesting as as those by themselves. Music, which the, the series is very well known for, uh, had some very big uh, composers on Mass Effect 3, and it's just uninspired. I don't even remember any of it. The only actual track I remember is the title track, and uh, it's from Mass Effect. It's from the original Mass Effect. Uh, and the crafting system, good god, the crafting system is a horrible mess. I didn't even bother using it. I had no idea what was going on with it. It's just uninspired characters. The combat system's not implemented well. It's very buggy animation-wise. It's heavily Dragon Age Inquisition, but in space. Um, and overall, Dragon Age Inquisition was a bit of a disappointment to me. This is even more so. I can't really recommend Andromeda. I mean, if you like Mass Effect, you might be able to look past its faults. I did. I got all the way through the game. I'm not exactly pushed to go back and play it. I'm more pushed to go back and play the trilogy. Let's try the scourge. Do it! You're 
reputation certainly precedes you, Agent Ray. I'll take that as a compliment, Agent Reyes. It's how it was intended. I'm sure it was. Let's photograph the victim and head into town to talk to the local sheriff. The body is starting to pixelate. Thimbleweed Park, developed and published by Terrible Toy Box. Thimbleweed Park was originally a Kickstarter game uh, in November uh, 2014 uh, and eventually came out um, earlier this year on PC and Xbox, I think it was in March, and is now available on PS4, which is why I'm playing. Thimbleweed Park is a very, very old school uh, point and click adventure developed by uh, Ron Gilbert, who is responsible for Maniac Mansion and the early Monkey Island games in around the 80s. So he knows his shit about point and click adventures, basically. Uh, and Thimbleweed Park was envisioned as uh, a game that would have come out in and around that time. So it's kind of going for that mid to late 80s aesthetic and gameplay wise, using the kind of verb and sentence structure that the old point and click adventures would use. Story wise, you are playing at the outset two FBI agents who have come to this small town, Thimbleweed Park, and there's been a murder. You are investigating said murder. Um, it's got a very strong X Files and Twin Peaks vibe to it, um, but it's also humorous, very dry humor, uh, and very meta at a lot of times. There's a there's a lot of knowing winks and nods that oh this is a video game, this is a point and click adventure, and it's got all these tropes that we need to follow. Uh, it does climb a bit too far into the meta pit at sometimes. Sometimes I'd want it to just you know stick stick to the script kind of thing. It's a lot of fun though, if you've ever played any of the old point of click adventures, it's very similar. It's very kind of similar structure. You start off playing as two two FBI agents, but the cast later expands and you have five people that you're kind of swapping between, and they all have their own uh, agenda for the story. The puzzle presentation uh, is a bit frustrating. A lot of the time the game will present you with a puzzle, and you have no way of solving it until a lot later on in the game. And I thought that was a bit strange and very frustrating because I spent a lot of time on a couple of puzzles only to find out that I can't solve them for a while. A couple of chapters later I'll be able to solve them. I was like, okay, I kind of wish I had known that beforehand. But there is a way to know that beforehand. There's an inbuilt hint system, but I don't really believe in using hint systems. So the only way I found out was I basically went, okay, fine, I will use the hint thing. And the hint thing basically said, you can't actually solve this yet. Oh, great, fine. So that's a bit annoying. But other than that, I found it very enjoyable. The game also has a casual and a hard mode for puzzles. There's a lot of content in the game that I was playing through casual mode, and I thought, why am I interacting with a lot of these things? I'm, I'm assuming that's what a hard mode is. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, Escape from Monkey Islands easy mode and hard mode, or normal mode and hard mode, however you want to put it. That was a lot of fun. Um, so I'm I'm actually looking forward to doing the hard version of Thimbleweed Park. Maybe not right away. I'll give it a, I'll give it a minute. But I had a lot of fun playing it, despite the kind of frustration with the, the puzzles, but puzzles that I could solve were, were enjoyable. And the humor is, is good. Uh, it's very... It's very Ron Gilbert, let's put it that way. Uncharted The Lost Legacy, developed by Naughty Dog and published by Sony. So The Lost Legacy was originally going to be a DLC for Uncharted 4, and was eventually turned into a standalone title when they realised this is going to be a lot bigger than just your standard DLC pack, so... It's its own thing now. Uh, it's about 8 hours, so it's not a full... It's not a full Uncharted game, uh, and the price reflects that it's only 40 euro. When I bought it, anyway, it might be it might be even less when you, when you get around to it. So it's not a full title. 
but it's still Uncharted, so it's still a kind of mix of banter and combat and puzzles. So if you like Uncharted, you will probably like The Lost Legacy, and if you are, like me, a little fatigued by Uncharted, you might not feel as kindly towards The Lost Legacy. I kind of liked it though. I do feel the way I felt about Uncharted 3 and 4 in that I don't like the combat anymore. Um, I do feel it gets in the it gets in the way of what I want from Uncharted, which is just story and puzzles and exploration and a bit of a history lesson and with a bit of combat. I don't like how heavy the series seems to have gotten with combat. It's not that bad in The Lost Legacy, for me anyway. The combat is a bit more manageable. You don't have as many enemy types and annoyances. They don't just pop up out of nowhere. Like It felt like they just pop up out of nowhere in Uncharted 3 and 4. Anyway, in The Lost Legacy you play Chloe Fraser, who is returning from Uncharted 2 and 3, and she is accompanied by Nadine Ross from uh, Uncharted 4, who was an antagonist in, in, yeah. in Uncharted 4. Claudia Black is voicing Chloe Fraser as usual. Uh, she also voices Morrigan in the Dragon Age series, so I have I have a bit of a soft spot and a bit of a hard spot uh, for Claudia Black's voice. It uh, feels good. Uh, and Laura Bailey is voicing Nadine Ross, that she did for Uncharted 4. She also voices Catwoman in Telltale's Batman series, which I'm doing a Let's Play of, that I will get back to, I promise. Watch this space. The developers took the chance uh, in Lost Legacy to do a couple of the different things. There's a big, there's a big open area uh, very early in the game that has three major things that you need to do to progress the plot. But there's a lot of smaller, kind of mini encounters with enemies and mini puzzles that you can that are entirely optional. You don't even need to do them. You should because they're a lot of fun, and they're just dotted around a kind of fairly big map. I mean, they kind of had a bit of that in Uncharted 4, but not to this extent. And I really like that. That's a very interesting way to go with the series, and I hope they do a bit more of that. And what I didn't like uh, is that it very quickly goes back to being a linear, typical Uncharted tale. Um, which I do like, but having seen the big open area, I kind of wanted a bit more of that. As with a lot of Naughty Dog's uh, later games, Uncharted and Last of Us, there's a lot of little small details. Like, there's a bit where I spotted a treasure, but I wasn't able to get to it. Later on, I was able to get back to it, and I walked in, I picked up the treasure, and I walked back out, and your party member goes, Oh, I must have missed that. Ha 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 ha. And you're like, fuck's sake. And then you got a fairly helpful partner, AI, which doesn't always happen. Um, there's a bit in one of the puzzles where I hadn't quite lined up this light beam with another light beam. And I was on my way back over to kind of fix it, and they're like, No, I got it. I'll fix it for you. And they're like... Shit, they knew. They knew I would they knew I'd screw it up. There's a lot of that in the game if you go looking for it. And that's like it's a lot of fun to see it pop up because you know it doesn't really happen in most games. Your party member sort of just there and it's just somebody to talk to, so the main character isn't talking to themselves. You're not a crazy person. There's a lot to like in The Lost Legacy, and if you like Uncharted, you will like The Lost The Lost Legacy, even if you are a bit tired of it. If it's the combat you're tired of, it's not as bad. If, you're, if you have the same feelings that I do. I w I'd say give it a look. It's Again, it's not a full price title, so it was only 40 euro. So if you have the money and you like Uncharted, give it a look. Here we go. Oh! Oh! Hellblade, Senua's Sacrifice, developed and published by N Ninja Theory. Ninja Theory have made games like Heavenly Sword, uh, Enslaved, Odyssey to the West, DMC Devil May Cry, which I have two full LPs of, for Enslaved and DMC. So I quite like Ninja Theory, I quite like their games, and so I was very, very looking forward to playing Hellblade. Ninja Theory are billing this as an independent AAA game. So that's basically them saying, all the production values of a AAA title, but none of the restrictions that a publisher will put on you, so it's independently published. So they don't have to they don't have to listen to Sony or Microsoft or EA telling them to throw multiplayer at it or put microtransactions in it. And this focus group doesn't like 
this person's face, change their face. None of that, right? It's complete creative freedom. And if this is an indication of where they're going with that kind of idea, uh, good. I'm looking forward to their next attempt at it. So, Senua Sacrifice, you play Senua, who is a Pict. This is a type of Celt. And she is traveling through the Norse Underworld, or to the Norse Underworld, which is hell. That's where the, that's where the word comes from. Uh, to rescue her lover. On the surface, that's what the game is about. Uh, there's a lot of reflections of uh, psychosis and PTSD that Senua appears to be suffering from. And the developers did say that they had consulted with doctors and patients suffering from those illnesses to kind of give an accurate portrayal of it within the game. Uh, it is quite uh, disturbing to play. There's this... So the game uses binaural sound. So if you have headphones, use headphones. Get a, get a decent set and play this game to do 3D audio and you have voices talking to you while you're walking around the environment. It's actually quite uh, disturbing and very off-putting. So good job. Gameplay-wise, the game kind of boils down to three main branches. You've got combat, you've got puzzles, and you've got walking simulation, more or less, uh, that just reflects the story. Puzzle-wise, you are attempting to find runes in the environment to try to pattern match the environment to specific runes to open doors. It's kind of weird when it gets started, but later on in the game you kind of know what you're doing and you can find the areas fairly easily. There are some unique spots in the environment that you're like, okay, this is this is where it is, it's fine. Combat is a lot of fun. Combat-wise, you have your light attack on square and you have your heavy attack on triangle. So still fairly basic, you've got a block and you've got a parry and you can dodge and so on. It seems very personal, almost dueling based, the way the camera pulls in you like you're only only fighting one enemy at a time. You will be fighting groups of enemies, but you're targeting just one. It's very close in. It looks like this is what God of War will be going for. That's what that's my takeaway from it. And um, the game doesn't necessarily tell you how combat works. You sort of have to work it out for yourself. There's no button prompts. You have to work out that parries exist. You have to work out that you can dodge away. What button is dodge? What button is run? That you have a running attack that if you don't attack while you're running you'll do something else you know there's, there's a lot of play for what's a very simple combat system there's a lot of work going into it they also use the voices that are talking to you to sort of give you hints that you're about to be attacked off screen you know they say like watch out and in the area that you're going to be attacked from so you'll hear it behind you they'll say look out and you have to dodge away from that attack so there's there's a lot there for what's a very simple system uh, the game also has an auto difficulty, which I'm not a big fan of, and I would actually suggest you turn off. Because there's a massive difficulty spike, which I assume the way the, the system works is, if you don't die, or you're successfully getting through combat, they just up the combat difficulty. And by the end of the game, it was getting to be just a, the timing for parries, more or less, which wasn't great. I felt very overwhelmed, which maybe that's what they were going for, but it wasn't really fun at the end. Uh, I would suggest pick a difficulty and just stick with it. Because um, there's no there's no real reward for an adaptive difficulty. You never really feel like you're getting better at it because the game just gets harder to match you. There's also, there's been some talk of whether or not the game has a permadeath feature. I don't know. I can't tell you whether or not it does because while the game is kind of difficult combat wise, uh, I only died once and I didn't, like it wasn't permanent. So... I don't know, is the answer to that question. There might be, and the game is fairly upfront about it, that there might be a permadeath thing, but it doesn't appear to have one, anyway. But I can't say for definite. I really, really liked Hellblade. Uh, it looks fantastic. The character models, the, the motion capture, the story, just the way just the way it's all performed is just really, really good. Uh, there's a weird mix of CG models and real people, just blurred, so they don't look like real people, and it's kind of weird, but you get used to it after a while. I really hope they make something else with this engine, like this kind of idea. If it's a sequel, fine. If they take a new character, that's great too. Uh, I'm really looking forward to what, what they go, what they do with this, and I hope this does really well. And with that in mind, maybe you should buy it. Uh, it's only it's only 40 euro. It's not a full price game. That's the indie triple A thing. So, you know, buy this because I because I want a sequel. So buy it. Thanks. Bye. So those were some of the games I played in August 2017. 
Coming up next month, for September, uh, we're looking at Destiny 2, which I may or may not get. I'm actually still on the fence about that, since I don't... This is a multiplayer game and I have nobody to play it with, so maybe... You might see it, you might not, I don't know. After that, we've got a game called Ruiner, which is an isometric shooter that's kind of cyberpunk aesthetic to it, which I'm quite looking forward to. It's getting a lot of good... Getting a lot of good feedback, so hopefully that will be very good. Other than that, there's nothing else that I can think of. Nothing that springs to mind anyway, so we may have to pull something out of something out of the heap. Something out of my uh, my backlog of shame. Uh, and we'll look at them instead. Otherwise, I hope you like this video. I will be getting back to my LPs, and I know I said that earlier and I didn't, but I mean it this time, for reals. Otherwise, if that doesn't happen again, for reals, I'll see you next month's video.